Now, I want to show you a principle in Matthew 25 before we get to the teaching. In Matthew 25, verse number 14, the Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants. Notice he didn't call servants. He called his own servants. That's very important. Called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man, look at this phrase, according to his several ability. The Bible says God will not put more on you than you're able to bear. That's important to understand. Not everybody has the same abilities, but everybody can be used if they give their availability to God. And notice what else it says. According to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. So the one that had five turned them into ten. It said, and likewise, he that received two, he also gained other two. He that had two made four. And look at verse 17. And likewise, he that or uh, verse 18, and he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Can I say a lot of people are hiding their talents? And then we find in verse 19, And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. You don't need to underscore that. The Lord Jesus has been gone 2,000 years. He's coming. And He's coming and He's going to judge His people. There's going to be a reckoning day. The Bible says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the deeds done in our body, whether they be good or evil. Let's read on. And so that he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents, and behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You ought to underscore verse 21. That ought to be your goal as a believer. You ought to long to hear the Lord tell you, Well done, and enter into the joy of the Lord. Let's look at verse number 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, here it is again, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where uh, thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and I went and I hid thy talent in the earth, and Lo, there hast, uh, there hast thou that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reaped where I sow not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for these that have come out tonight. We thank you for the good singing. We do pray for Miss Billy's granddaughter that has surgery on Friday, that God, you would be with her and that all would go well. We pray for those of our number that are sick, those that are not feeling well. Lord, I pray for them. I pray you would touch them. Lord, help them to know that we miss them. And God, I pray that you being the great physician would reach down from heaven and God, uh, touch their bodies and help their sickness to be short, help them recover soon, recover fully. And God, bring them back safely into our church. We miss them when they're not here. Now, Father, you know the need of every heart. I pray that you'd bless the reading of the Word of God. Help us, Lord, to our minds to be illuminated to truth. Help us, Lord, to certainly draw closer to God and help us to become doers of the Word of God. Bless those that are watching via live stream or those that are listening. 
Uh, Lord, I pray that, God, you would bless them and their efforts. Bless every true church assembled tonight preaching the Word of God. Get glory to your wonderful and glorious name. Father, we'll bless you and praise you for it, for it's in the holy name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Amen. I just want to say the one that had the one talent, he went and hid it because he was fearful. He said, I knew that thou was a hard man and I was afraid. And can I say there are some people that don't do anything for God because they're afraid. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. Notice when the master came, the master didn't say, I'm taken away because you was a fearful man. He said, because you were a slothful man. Now, I read all of that because we find Jesus teaching in this chapter on stewardship. On stewardship. Stewardship is commanded and expected of every Christian. Where much is given, much is required. Now, can I say, uh, 1 Corinthians 4 2 says this Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, stewardship simply means the management of the affairs or the estate of another. Now, the Lord Jesus left his church here on earth and he left it in our hands that we might manage it, that we might be caretakers of his estate while he has gone away, but he is coming back for his church. And can I say, as we'll get into in a, in a couple of weeks, he's coming back for a church without spot and without blemish. But we are all caretakers of those things that God has blessed us with. Now, can I say this? Christians are to be good stewards of several things. We're to be good stewards of our time. We get 168 hours a week. How much of that do we actually spend for the honor and glory of God? How much do we spend reading His Word? How much do we spend praying? How much do we spend uh, telling others about Jesus? How much do we spend in church worshiping Him? How much time do we really spend for God's glory? If we're all honest, we all lack in that area. I wonder at the judgment seat if God's going to show us how much time we spent watching TV and then how little time we spent on Him. I wonder if, if He's going to show us how much time we spent uh, on the Internet and how little time we spent for Him. If we really take inventory on that, we're all lacking stewards when it comes to our time. Can I say that Christians... Uh, uh, are also to be good stewards of their talents. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God made us all as individuals. He made us all different. None of us have the same uh, uh, fingerprints. We're all different. And He's given all of us certain talents. There are some things that you can do that I can't do. There are things I can do that you can't do. God's not interested in what you can't do. God is interested in you taking what He has blessed you with and using it for His glory. I've learned this. If you don't use your talents for the Lord, He'll take them away and give them to somebody else. I've known people who used to sing for the Lord, quit singing, and then they lose their ability to sing. I've known folks that used to teach the Bible, quit teaching the Bible and lose their mind when it comes to teaching the Bible. And we can go on and on and on. I've known people that uh, uh, used to be just people, people. You know, they, they can talk to anybody. And, and, and at one time, they were used of God to be a witness for God. Then all of a sudden, they let bitterness in their life. And they quit being a people person. They quit being a witness for God. And end up in a hospital and not be able to talk to nobody. And it's a dangerous thing to not use your talent and your abilities for the Lord. It's amazing. There are some people that can crochet and they can crochet for God's glory. There are some people that can write and can write for God's glory. God's given us all kinds of talents. How much do we use those abilities for His glory? Can I say this? Christians are to be good stewards of their testimony. You ought to protect your testimony. Your testimony is what other people think about you. 
you ought to protect it. Now, they may not agree with you. They may not even like you. But their testimony should be, uh, uh, when they testify of you, they should say, well, what they believe, they practice. The indictment in this day and age is the indictment of hypocrisy. Folks say one thing and then they do something else. This is what the Bible says about our testimony. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I wonder how our testimonies are looking. And then uh, the last thing that we're to be good stewards of is our tithe. The tithe. That's the dirty word in most Baptist churches. Tithing. Hmm? Can I say the matter of tithing will reveal the heart of a Christian? It will. Folks that don't tithe show that they don't love the Lord like they should. Folks that don't tithe don't have faith that God can take care of them. Now, I know when you think about it logically, it does not make sense. It does not make sense when you struggle to take your 100% and you struggle to make ends meet sometimes. That if you give 10% of that to God and your 100% didn't go far enough, how's your 90% going to go? Well, the bottom line is, friends, it don't make sense. Faith never makes sense. Logic and faith are enemies. Faith says, I'm just going to trust God. And can I say, for years, Miss Annette and I on paper, we wasn't going to make it. But we never, ever missed a meal. We never missed a bill. We never missed anything. We were blessed, blessed, blessed. Because we learned the secret to being blessed. And that's putting God first. And folks that don't tithe have a lack of faith. All you got to do is read the Bible. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you see where God has always taken care of his people. He'll take care of you, friend. It's a matter of faith. I mean, those Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. They didn't go hungry. They didn't go thirsty. God took care of them. And if God can do that, he can take care of you, friend. Hmm? But a lot of people have a tithing issue. They have a heart issue. Because tithing reveals their heart. Now, let me give you some things about tithing, since you're so excited about this lesson. First of all, let me define tithing. The word tithe literally means to levy a tenth part on. It means to give a tenth. It doesn't mean pay all your bills, put a little money away, and then whatever you got left, give, to, give, give a couple dollars. Now you go to most missionary Baptist churches, that's what they believe. The tithe means a tenth. Now, mathematically, it means a tenth of your gross income. Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Render unto God what is God. The government takes their percentage off at the top. God should come first. He should take the 10% off the top. 10% off your gross. Let me give you some scripture because I know some of you are scratching your head. In Genesis 28, 22, listen to the Bible. Jacob said this, And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. That's important. Hebrews 7, 4 says this. Now consider how great this man was, talking about Melchizedek, unto whom the, even the patriarch Adam or Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. So we find that mathematically the tithe means a tenth of your gross income. Abraham didn't take the spoils back and then part it all out and then give a tenth. He gave a tenth off the top before he even got home. To Melchizedek. Melchizedek, if you study it out, he's Jesus in the Old Testament. Jacob said, I'm going to build a, a house here where I put this stone. He called it Bethel. And he said, I'm going to give the tenth part to the Lord. Mathematically, tithing means a tenth. Can I say scripturally, 
Tithing is commanded. Listen to the Bible. Deuteronomy 14, 22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. Again, thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. We're to tithe based on what God prospers us with. Morally, tithing is a debt. Jesus paid a debt that we could not pay. And morally, we are indebted to Him. Malachi 3.8 said, will a, God, will a man rob God? We're talking about morals here. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? He said, in tithes and offerings. In Deuteronomy 8.18, the Bible says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant, which He swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. God's the one that gave you everything you got. He has blessed you with every penny you've got. He's blessed you with your home. He's blessed you with your vehicle. He's blessed you with your family. He's blessed you with your clothing. He's blessed you with the food in your cupboard. He's blessed you with your job or your source of income. He has blessed you with even the breath in your body. And God says, I have given you this to get wealth. And I require a tithe. So mathematically, it's a tenth. It is scripturally commanded. Morally, it's a debt. But then economically... Tithing is an investment. Listen to the Bible. Matthew 6.20 says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Mm, that verse is simply saying you can't outgive God. And the more you give, the more He gives back unto you. Pressed down, shaken, bubbling over, shall men give into your bosom. My dear friends, I, I could tell you stories from here till the cows come home how God's taking care of this old boy. Hmm? I remember one time, uh, it was right after. Well, it was right before Nett and I got married. I bought a little Zuzu pickup truck. Y'all remember them? Do you know is Zuzu's the oldest Japanese car maker? They're not sold in the U.S. anymore because they didn't meet all the safety standards. They wouldn't put in 87 airbags and all that kind of stuff. But it, Zuzu still makes cars. You'll see them overseas, and you'll see them. But I bought an Zuzu pickup truck. Can I say something about a Zuzu pickup trucks? Every one of them I ever seen rusted, and rusted bad because they use that cheap. Japanese steel. It rusted bad. I bought a Zuzu pickup truck. Mine didn't have a spot of rust on it. Not a spot. Uh, back then I was young and stupid and didn't have a lot of money. And that night I got married shortly after I got that truck. Uh, I put 157,000 miles on that truck. I changed the oil in it three times. Kept on them running. I'm, I'm convinced, Brother Phil, it's still running in a junkyard somewhere. I believe God ordained that truck for me. Here's another thing. The tires that came on it weren't real good. I got 30,000 miles on the tires from the dealership. I put another set of tires on it. That other set of tires had 127,000 miles on it. Still had plenty of tread on it when, when the truck went bye-bye. Say, why? Because I put God first. I'd still have that truck today, probably. Uh, but I was driving down downtown Cincinnati, and I was on a one-way street, and some lady from out in the country was downtown, didn't know how to drive downtown. She made a wrong turn on a one-way street and hit me right where the door and the front fender met and totaled my truck. Or that thing would have still been probably at the foster household, or I'd have got tired of it and thrown it away. What I'm trying to say is, you can't outgive God. 
when Annette and I first got married, uh, the pastor of this church, Brother Fluger, Miss Lietta. Miss Lietta worked with somebody over at Calvary whose parents passed away and wanted to sell their parents' washer machine and dryer. We bought both of them for $50. Not 50 a piece, $50. I told Annette, I said, if they last six months, it's cheaper than going to the laundromat. We had that washing machine and dryer for, for 11 years. I got tired of looking at them. I went and bought her another, a new set. We've never had a set. I don't know how many sets we've had since. And we've never had a set like that first set. Huh? Why? Because God just takes care of his people. Hmm? Just takes care of his people. You can't outgive God. Most of you know the story. When I was in the corporate world and got blessed, and I ended up, I was, I was making big money in and uh, then God, who has a wonderful sense of humor, called me to pastor. The first church I pastored could only afford to pay me $150 a week. And that just had Christian. We had Jordan. And you hadn't told, can't tell by Jordan, he eats a lot. And I was used to making about $2,000 a week, and I'm making 150 a week. And uh, we just, God said go, we went. So I did it, everything I could on the side. I'd sling paint, I'd put roofs on, I, was, I was, did some electrical work. And back then Brother Ray had Ray Roberts Construction and let me do a little work with him. Well, in January that year we didn't have, we didn't have any work. I didn't have any work anywhere. And Miss Nett got to where she knew she could just told me, tell me what we needed to get out of the month. She wouldn't fret over it. I'll never forget, she came to me and she said, we need $617 to get out of the month. And I'm thinking to myself, why, why are you telling me? There ain't nothing I can do about it. You know, we ain't going to make it out of this month. We're going in the hole. Next day, my insurance man calls me. And that was nothing unusual. Uh, he called me and said, uh, hey, preacher, what are you doing? I said, I'm just hanging out at the house. He said, can you meet me at my office? I said, sure. So I met him at his office. I figured he's going to share some new product with me or something. And he's just small talk. And I'm thinking, why am I here? And finally he said, Preacher, the Lord woke me up today and told me to give you this. And he slid a check across his desk. It was for $625. Wow. But see, that's, that's, not, that's not how God operates. Because that said, pressed down, shaking, up, bubbling over. And then he looks at me and says, Preacher, you like ribs? Well, do I like ribs? He said, here, and he gave me a $100 gift card to Montgomery and Ribs. You say, what are you telling? I'm telling you, you can't outdo God. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And I could go on and on and on how God's taking care of me. Because God's that way. Y'all know Brother Mike, Brother Mike Goodson. When Nett and I first got married, my pastor, Brother Pittman, would have Brother Mike come preach revivals. And uh, I went out and bought Brother Mike a, a new pair of shoes. His pair of Rockport, when Rockports first came out, they made them dress ports, you know, and he's lightweight. And so I bought him, bought him a pair of Rockports. I hadn't seen nor heard from Brother Mike Goodson in 13 years. I'm laying in the bed, and, and the Lord touches my heart and says, you need to call Mike Goodson and book him for a revival. I didn't even know how to get a hold of him, Brother Clint. I didn't know. I didn't. So I called my pastor, and my pastor said, well, I got a number for him. I don't know if it's still good or not. So he gave me the number. Well, I called, and kind of like they did here about 20 years ago, they changed the area code. So I got the new area code, and I called, and he answered the phone. I said, Brother Mike, you probably don't remember me. I said, I used to be with Brother Pittman. My name is Doug Foster. He says, I remember you. He said, you bought me a pair of shoes. He said, I got them on right now. Now, why do you say it, preacher? You see, that was God's man. And I wanted to be good to God's man. It wasn't that Annette and I had a lot of money back then, but I just bought him a pair of shoes because I just felt led to do that. You wouldn't believe how many times people have bought me shoes and how many people have bought me ties, how many people have bought me shirts, and how many. And it comes back to me. See, however you give out, that's how God gives back to you. Press down shaking, bubbling over. Now those of you who golf with me know that I'm not much of a golfer. But I got the nicest set of golf clubs that anybody that's not a good golfer can carry. Huh? 
used to have a preacher friend of mine, Brother Wayne Holmby, who was up here one time playing golf. He got these clubs. He looked at me and said, I'm going to give you these clubs. The shafts on my clubs were $150. I mean, they're a match tour set of tailor-made golf clubs. At that time, when he gave them to me, it was 2500 bucks for the irons. He said, he said, yeah, he said, I had a guy give me these. And he said, I want to give you these. Uh, he said, I, I don't really care for them. I'm going to give them to you. Well, I was telling a friend of mine about that. Sometime after that, we was playing golf. He says, well, don't you remember? I said, remember what? He said, you bought me a set of golf clubs years ago. I'm just trying to tell you, you can't outdo God. Economically, it's good to be faithful. When you lay up treasure in heaven, it always comes back to you, friend. Now listen to me. Uh, I don't know if you've got a 401k, or I don't know if you've got an IRA, or, or any of those things, but i tell you one thing. If Trump don't get reelected, I'm going to miss him, because my, my IRA has done pretty good with old, old Don in the office. You know what I'm saying? Not that I got a whole lot of money in there, but I keep looking. You know, I look at it about every two weeks. I looked at it money. I said, "Hallelujah, glory to God. God's good." Amen. Amen. You say, "What are you trying to say?" If we do that for earthly things, why wouldn't we lay up treasure in heaven? Because you know what? If Don don't get in there, our IRAs and four hundred one ks and stuff might be in trouble. But I promise you this: anything you've laid up in heaven, <laughs> it's not going to ever go down. Hmm? So I'm just trying to help you economically mm, is a good thing but tithing you also got to look at it spiritually it's a blessing uh, Malachi 3.10 says bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it I want to tell you those who tithe, they spiritually receive a blessing. Now, I know some people that factor it out to the penny every week how much they've got to give. I know people that way. I'm just like, well, they give. But we don't pay attention. You know, Miss Nett writes out the check, and, you know, we, we, we'll get into a, a, a minute some ways to offer, but we always give more than a tithe. We give a tithe and an offering. We give a mission offering every week. But I really have no idea how much we give until the end of the year when the treasurer gives us the statement. I always like that day because I always get to see how much we's able to give. I don't do that braggedly but I'm excited that we're able to give that much to God's work. I really do. It excites me. And, and it excites me when I look and see how much we make and then how much we give. And I, that blesses me. That, hey, God's been so faithful and so good to me. Look what I've been able to give back to God. And then God just keeps giving back and being faithful. He's a good God. Now, we've talked about tithing defined and what, what it'll do for you. But let me deal with tithing as a Bible principle. Um, there are many who say that tithing was given under the law and it's not valid today under grace. Uh, however, tithing was instituted long before the law uh, and it was practiced in the early New Testament church. It is a golden thread you find sewn throughout the Bible. And those that hang on to that it was given under the law, they, they, don't, they don't get to the needle of the thread and where it started and that it's continued. Let me give you this. You might want to pin this down. I'm not going to read these verses. I'm going to throw them at you. Abraham commenced tithing in Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20, when he met Melchizedek. Jacob continued it, where we read a minute ago, in Genesis 28, verses 20 through 22. Moses confirmed it in Leviticus 27.30. Malachi commanded it in Malachi 3.10. Jesus commended it in Matthew 23.23. 23. And Paul conformed it in 1 Corinthians 16.2. So you find it throughout the Bible. Before the law, during the law, 
during Jesus's when he walked upon the earth and during the early church during the instruction of the early church you find tithing as a Bible principle now let's look at tithes and offerings there's a difference again we read a minute ago uh, Malachi 3 8 and it says in that you rob me in tithes and offerings now I believe God means what he says and says what he means God knows the difference between tithe and offering. If they was the exact same, he'd either call it the tithe or the offering. But he called tithes and offerings. So let's look at the type of offerings. We mentioned the tithe. That's the tenth part. The tithe uh, is uh, uh, that which belongs to God. If you would learn that principle that whenever you get whatever God prospers you with, right off the top, a tenth belongs to God. That's His. Now, again, He gave it all to you. He's blessed you with everything, and all He requires in return is a tenth. The tithe is that which belongs to God. That is an act of obedience. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to give God the tithe. Then there's what we call a love offering. A love offering is that which is ours. It's an act of love. We have a visiting preacher in. We give him an offering. That's a love offering. That really belongs to you, but through an act of love, you're giving it to that preacher or that missionary or that cause. Sometimes we'll take up an offering for a needy family in the church. Well, that's an act of love. You're giving that out of love uh, to that cause. You have the love offering. You have the tithe, tithe and offerings. And then there's the mission offering, or some call it faith promise offering. Faith promise offering is that which we don't have. And that's an act of faith. Now, let me explain how we do things here at the church. We take up the offerings. People give their tithe and offerings. Since before I came to Emmanuel Baptist Church, uh, under the, the church voting and constitution in previous administrations, 10% of the general fund goes to missions. So whatever is given, 10% goes to missions. Well, you go back and count all them missionaries, and that's not all that we support. What we take in, 10% is not paying them. We also, uh, from time to time, will ask you to pray about what to give to missions above and beyond your tithe and your offerings. Now, when you pray and ask God, God, how much do you want me to give? You're asking God to tell you what to give of that which you don't have, but you're going to have faith that I'm giving this because God's going to supply it. And by the way, it's impossible for God to lie. God burdens your heart to give $5 a week to missions, and you say, well, I don't got it. But God said to do it, and you do that, my dear friends, that's, that's an act of faith. And God honors faith. And a mission offering is above your tithe and your offerings. And a lot of folks give their tithe, they give to missions. Some just give to missions in general. Some have a burden to support certain missionaries. And they give money to specific missionaries. All that, every penny, goes to that missionary. That's an act of faith. So we have the, the tithe, the love offering, and a mission offering. And, you know, time to time we'll do a special offering. Like I mentioned, we're going to be building a building. So if the Lord touches your heart, put some money in the building fund. That all goes into the building fund. Again, that's an act of faith. That's an act of love. That's an act of obedience. Giving to what God's told you to give, and that will get the job done. Now, while we're on that, there are a lot of independent Baptist church like to beat their chest and say, we built this building, we didn't owe a penny when we got done. That's a blessing. But what they do is they tell their people to never take a vacation, never do anything extra, don't take your kids up to Kings Island over the summer, don't do anything extra, any extra money you got, put here in the church, and they build it by the money they get in. And Brother Aaron, they, they build it, and they're debt-free when they build it, but sometimes it takes them 10 or 15 years to get it built. Well, that's one way to do it. But they look down at you if you borrow money to build a building. Well, which is a better testimony? 
well, we're sitting here in a partial building because we can't get it built because we're waiting for people to pay it and we're draining our people and they never get to get any time off or anything. We just keep taking all their money and they never go to get to go see Mickey Mouse or King's Island or anything. And, you know, you can do it that way. Or we just, you know, people give and whatever's left over, we just go and borrow. And we got faith, we'll just pay it off monthly and we'll sit in a nice new building and not have to wait 10 years for it. Are you, are you with me? So anyway, uh, I'll tell you, bought your house, wasn't it? Unless you're Clint, he writes a check for everything. Uh, he lives in Triple Crown, wrote a check for it. No, I'm lying, I'm lying, don't know, I'm lying. Uh, I don't even know where he lives. I know it's somewhere over in Alexandria somewhere, Gold Springs or somewhere. He lives over there by NKU. I don't know. So anyway, yeah. But we've seen what a tithe and offering is. A tithe belongs to God. It's an act of obedience. An offering is that which is ours. We give it as an act of love. And then there's a mission offering or faith promise. That is many times what we don't have, but God told us to do it, and we do it through an act of faith. You know, there's been times, Net and I being a service, and God touched my heart, and I tell her, write a check, and she knew that the money wasn't there. But before that thing got to our bank, the money was there. God told me to just give, and you give, and then God supplies. It's an amazing thing how God works. Can I say, living by faith is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it's somebody who's close to God. Uh, well, you just trust God to take a step. You know, when you're looking at it, you don't see any way. But God says, step, you step. When you step, God catches your foot. That's, that's hard living, friend. But it's blessed living. Hmm? But then, let's look at the collection of the tithes and offerings uh, where is your tithe and your offering to go there's some people believe well as long as I give my 10% if I want to give 10 per, you know, I want to give some money to Jimmy Swaggart and if I want to give some money to this ministry down the road and if I want to give some money on down here and whatever's left I'll put in the church then people have that mentality as long as I'm giving it to some religious thing that's my tithe there are also people saying, well, I'm driving to church, so that's part of my tithe, putting it in a gas tank. Well, what's the Bible say? Again, in Malachi chapter number 3, verse 10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Well, what is the storehouse? That's God's appointed store. That is the local church treasury. When are we to give our tithes? 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. When are we to pay our tithes? On the first day of the week. Where are we to pay our tithes? The local church, God's storehouse. Hmm? That there might be meat in my house, the Lord said. So we're to pay them on the first day of the week. That's why we don't take up an offering on Wednesday night unless we want to take up a love offering for somebody. You know, I know some churches, every time you walk in the doors, they're going to bleed you for money. Uh, we didn't even take up an offering Sunday night and people kept giving me money. So I took it back there and put it in the treasurer's office. Huh? Uh, but you are to take up the tithe and offering. The collection of the, uh, for the saints is on the first day of the week. You do know why we worship on the first day of the week, don't you? That's when Jesus got up out of the grave. First day of the week. Huh? People say, well, you need to keep the Sabbath. No, that's what the Jews had to do. We worship Jesus because he got up on the first day of the week. And so we see the collection for the tithes and the offering. We see what a tithe is. We see what an offering is. We see it's a biblical principle throughout the Bible. We see that uh, there is many reasons to tithe. It's scripturally commanded. There's a moral reason why. There's an economical reason why. There's a spiritual reason why. There's a mathematical reason why that we give a tenth. So we see all of that. We see the benefits for it and the blessings of it. But my dear friends, you can talk about tithing until you're blue in the face, but until you put it into practice, you'll never see the benefit of it. I cannot explain to you exactly how God makes up that 10% other than the fact that He just does. Now let me say this. 
in Malachi 3 he says you've robbed me and they say wherein have we robbed thee he said in tithes and offerings the next verse says and because of that you're cursed with a curse when you don't tithe you don't have the blessings of God matter of fact I'll say this God always gets his tithe now when you give it he blesses you by giving it back to you and then some but if you don't give it and he has to take it it'll cost you more than your tithe that's why some people aren't blessed that's why some people always struggle that's why some people's always having problems with something not working something breaking down something wearing out something having to be replaced that constantly whatever they get funnels right out because they haven't learned the blessing of tithing God, if you belong to God he gets your money one way or the other but it's more blessed to give than to receive and God loveth a cheerful giver tithing is, is a real blessing and real important when you learn the benefits of tithing alright uh, that's the offerings we beat that horse I don't preach on money much because we have so many people who do give does everybody give I'm sure they don't those that don't they miss out they miss out on the blessings those that give could testify how good God's been to them you know and, and we, we may not be wealthy but we're blessed and I'd rather be blessed than wealthy hmm? there's a whole lot more to it than that but let me give you the second thing tonight I also want to preach on the objective of the church why do we need a church you know I hear people say well I can worship God out at the lake I can worship God on the, on the golf course. Well, you, you probably think you can, but that's not what God commanded. He gave us the church. We're to assemble in the church. The Bible said we're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. In the church. But what is the objective or the motivation of the church? Why are we here? Some people think, well, we're just here to come and fellowship and get along and and do well, you can do that you know at any organization you know the church is not an organization we're a living organism of the Lord Jesus Christ he's alive and those that are believers are alive forevermore we are an arm of the Lord we are an organism not an organization you can go join an organization and fellowship with people that's, that's not the, the objective of the church there are three things that I want to discuss about mm, the objections of the church it's a threefold constitution can I say first of all the motivation of the church ought to be to evangelize sinners the Bible says in Matthew 28, Jesus' last command, for he resurrected into heaven. He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Jesus told us to go. Teach. Then baptize them that believe and then teach again teach them all the things what we're doing in this study teaching people what the Bible says that's what we're, we're to evangelize those who are unbelievers the Bible said this in Mark 16 verse 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned notice the order believe baptized or reject and you're damned it's very simple but where to go Romans tells us how can they believe unless they've heard and how can they hear without a preacher we're to go and preach the gospel you say brother Doug I've not been called to be a preacher no but you are to be a steward of what God's blessed you with and he's told us to go so you can take a track out there and hand it to somebody and they can read how to be saved you can share your testimony how God saved you and you can win somebody to God the whole idea is is to point people to Jesus and tell them what it takes to be saved to be born again Acts chapter 1 says this verse 8 
But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Matthew 28 said, go to all nations. In Mark 16, he says, go ye into all the world. And in Acts chapter 1, he said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. Well, we live in Florence, Kentucky, or around here. You work around here. How can you go to Judea, Jerusalem, the other most parts of the world, to all the world, and work a job? You can't afford to go and fly you know, on Saturdays and fly back. How can you go to all the world? Well, we can't. That's why we support all the missionaries that take the gospel to where God's called them in those parts of the world. We can't go, but we can help them go. And when we support missions, when they win somebody to God, God looks at us just as if we'd have won that person to God, and God gives us credit for that. There'll be crown, uh, stars in our crowns for that because we were faithful to make sure the gospel was to go into all the world. We're to evangelize sinners. Jesus came seeking to save that which was lost. And when the church is in tune with God, the church will have a burden to see people come to God, to see people saved. We're to evangelize sinners. The second motivation of the church is to edify the saints. When you spend the vast majority of your 168 hours a week in the world, you get beat up by the world. The world's mindsets, the world's philosophy, the world's at enmity with the things of God. Uh, the world hates the things of God. Hmm. Why do you think so many of these politicians want to shut down churches? It's because they're afraid you're going to catch COVID? No, they just hate the things of God. They don't shut down Home Depot. Because they get a profit from that. The world is against the church and against you. And you but you've got to live in the world. You turn on the news and you hear all that comes from the news. You know what's wonderful about coming to church? You get to hear about the gospel, the good news. And in the world, it'll bring you down. It'll discourage you, as we preached on over the weekend. The world will wear you out. You listen to the world's music. You listen to the world's philosophy. You watch the world's show. I mean, they even ruined Hallmark this year. Huh? Need I say? In Hallmark, when you got men falling in love with the love flakes, it's time to go. Hmm? I ain't watching them. Uh, it's sickening, it's disgusting. Now let me just throw something else at you. I've been just noticing. I preached not long ago, a couple years ago, on how the world is demasculating the man. You know, we'll get into the home and we'll get into God's creation probably before this is all over. But God made the man to be the head of the household. He made the woman from man, and she's to be subject to her own husband, and the children are to be obedient to their parents. But I, I you know, I'm going to get in trouble, but I can't help it. I'm sick and tired of seeing so many of these sissified men wearing skinny jeans. Are you listening to me? I mean, I grew up with John Wayne. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I grew up with uh, boxers knew how to bloody people's nose, you know? They didn't play patty cake or whatever they do now. Uh, I mean, I grew up with G.I. Joe and, you know, Green Berets and, you know, um, you had a cap gun until you was five, then you got a BB gun until you was seven, then you got the real thing. You know, that's how I grew up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, every, every, everybody I went to high school with, all those guys had our shotguns in the cars and trucks. Huh? We were men. We didn't play soccer. 
We play football. How come all these soccer guys are gay? Because they play soccer. <laughs> Christian got, got me in trouble one time because he told a neighbor boy who played soccer that he was a grass fairy. <laughs> so his mom called me and was chewing me. I said, I can't help you you're making your boy a grass fairy. Guess what his boy turned out to be? You guessed it. Mm -hmm. He's, but he doesn't have the grass anymore. Just trying to help you. But I've been watching. I've been watching these commercials. Watch, take note of how many men are doing the dishes. How many men are doing the laundry. How many men are sewing up their little girl's little cape that she's got for a little princess costume. Now listen, I, I, I mean, Clint, you ought to help do the laundry. Don't ask me to do it because I don't even know how to turn on the washing machine. Miss Nett, don't let me near the laundry. I mean, it, one time she let me in the kitchen. She said, why don't you blend these potatoes, make mashed potatoes. I've been blending They was on the ceiling. They was on the cabinets. They was, I ain't even allowed in the kitchen no more. I'm allowed to use the microwave. That's it. Because I'm a Neanderthal. She taught the boys. She said, you're not going to be like your father. She taught them how to cook. But I don't know how to cook. huh? But listen. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with you helping Miss Rhonda in the kitchen. Nothing wrong with you... You know, doing some laundry if you know how. You know, I, I can use a Tide stick. That's about it. You know, but there's nothing wrong with that. But notice what they're saying. The wife's nowhere to be said. What they are implying, the subliminal message is, the woman is working and the man is staying home and taking care of the household. Can I say God gave that duty to the woman? The household is her domain not the man's domain, and it's being portrayed that unless he's married to another man. They're portraying that too. Hmm? What I'm trying to say, that constantly attacking you, those little subliminal messages, just watching TV. I mean, I saw some of that watching Andy Griffith. And by the way, I saw the first Darling episode the other night. I thought of you, Eddie. The first one, I liked the first one anyway. That's when they let them down out of the hotel room and all that with the rope and all that. Brother Eddie bought me a picture of the darlings because he used to call the fellas that picked the possums, used to call them the darlings. But anyway, I got it in my office a picture of the darlings. But I'm just trying to say, I'm watching Andy Griffin, and I'm noticing these commercials, how sissified the men have become. And then you start watching some of the women, how masculine the women are becoming. And now they're glorifying this transgender crowd but what they don't do they don't interview the people that have the surgeries and change their genders a, a year, two years, three years down the, down the road and see how suicidal they are and how messed up they are because now they don't even know what they are I'm telling you our world's in a mess and you're inundated with that junk constantly and so when you come to the house of God you need to be built back up the word edify means to be built up. You need to find some encouragement. You need to find something that brings solution to your life, brings help to your life, brings some substance to your life that uh, is not tainted by the world's philosophies. And so the Bible says this in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also you do. You know what's great about being part of the church? Our church in particular, you can come in here and be transparent. Somebody come up and say, how you doing? You say, boy, I've had a rough week. Well, you got people that put their arms around you. They'll pray with you. They'll encourage you. They'll, they'll, they'll stay in contact with you. Make sure that a uh, 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 business picks up in your life. We're to edify one another. When somebody's hurting, we're all hurting. So we try to encourage somebody, try to help somebody, find out somebody's having financial problems. We'll uh, take up special offering, help them. Uh, find out somebody needs groceries, we'll get them some groceries. Uh, 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 find out somebody just needs prayer, just needs to know somebody cares. We'll rally around them and pray with them and be there for them. We're to edify one another. That's the beauty about being part of a church family. The Bible says this in Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know why everything we do is predicated on the preaching and teaching of the Word of God? Because this book will edify you. 
This book will help you. This book will give you a firm foundation that when everything else around you is falling apart, you will be able to stand because you're built on the right foundation. This book will help you. It enlighten you to truth. Mm, listen, I've said this for years. When a preacher's preaching, don't get caught up in his personality so much. Listen to what he has to say. And when he preaches this book, it don't matter if he turns red in the face and hoops, hollers, and screams like me, or if he just, just stands and teaches. If he gives you this book, you'll find some help in it. The book will edify you. It'll help you. And that's one aspect of the church. We're to evangelize sinners. We're to edify the saints. And then we're to do what Miss Noreen did in the beginning of service. We're to exalt the Savior. The Bible says this. Psalms 99.9 Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill for the Lord our God is holy. Psalms 107.32 Let them exalt Him also in the congregation of the people and praise Him in the assembling of the elders. Did you hear what it said? Let Him exalt Him in the congregation of the people. You can't do that at the lake. You've got to do it in the congregation. John 12, why do we exalt the Lord? Listen to what Jesus said in John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. When we lift him up, the emphasis is on him. People quit looking at us. He will draw them to himself. There's just something wonderful about Jesus. The Bible says in Psalms 18, verse 46, The Lord liveth. And blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Uh, Psalms 34, 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. My dear friends, when we come and assemble, we come to exalt him, to worship him, to give him the reverence that he is so worthy of. We come to edify one another. And we come to, and praying and hoping that if somebody comes that don't know the Lord, they'll know the Lord before they leave. And the reason we expect people to come uh, that don't know the Lord is because we've been out inviting folks to come who don't know the Lord. And we come to evangelize sinners. Now we started this thing on the tithes and offerings, and we're in this thing on worship, the objective of the church. But you know, when you give a tithe, that is a form of worship. You're being obedient to give the Lord what is due Him. Worship is a verb. It's an action word. And when you give, you are fulfilling that. When you take part in the service, whether you testify like Miss Noreen, give a prayer request like Miss Billy, sing a song like Brother Clint, sing in the congregational singing, whether or not you are praying in your seat or praying before you get here, whether or not you are listening and taking in the information that is being expounded so that you can practice it in your life and when you go outside these doors, uh, make it a part of your life uh, and uh, let it transform your life. All of it is a form of worship. Some people worship by hooping and hollering like squirrely. Some people worship, that's what he calls himself, squirrely. That's why I call him that. Some people worship with a tear running down their eyes. Some people worship with just putting a hand up. Some people worship with a smile. It's not about the emotion displayed. It's about what your heart is doing towards heaven. When you come, you ought to come seeking to exalt the Lord. Nothing exalts Him more than being obedient to what He says. And when you put into practice what He says, you're giving Him first place and you're reverencing Him. And friends, that's all He asks. He gave his best, and all he asked from us is us to give our best. Not the leftovers, just give him the best. We'll give him the first fruits, give him the best. We'll have a blessed life. And I can tell you this, you can't outgive God, and you can't put a price on his blessings. And all that comes from a little heart being obedient and walking by faith and doing what God says. You do that, friend, you'll be a blessed person. All right, I'm done. Brother Clint, why don't you get your guitar and just pick something out. Maybe you want to come and thank the Lord for being good to you, for blessing you, for taking how little you give back to Him and magnifying it. Maybe you want to come tonight and tell Him you love Him. Maybe He spoke to you about something else and you just want to come and do business with Him. Again, our rule around here is to mind the Lord and do what God says. So let's all stand. Some are coming to pray. He's going to pick out something on his guitar. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you.
thank you for the truths in the Bible. Lord, after every one of these lessons, my mind runs, and I realize there's so much more that could be said on every topic. Lord, take my inability and my inadequacy, and God, magnify yourself and do something in the hearts of your people. Father, again, we pray for those that had to watch live stream tonight who long to be here. I pray you'd bless them abundantly. These in attendance, God, I pray, Lord, you'd meet every need of their heart and their life. Help us to be faithful stewards of those things that you have prospered us with. I'm blessed now in this invitation. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.